get started. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Jim Brosnan. I'm one of your hosts for the, uh, I guess, August edition uh, of Tennessee Turf Tuesdays. We've got a really special uh, episode in store. Uh, we're we're only weeks away from UT football season, and I uh, have Brian Ogle uh, with the crew over at Neyland Stadium to talk to us about everything that's been going on um, over at Neyland. It's been a really big summer as they prepare for the upcoming football season. Before uh, we get started with kind of our technical content uh, for the session, want to go through some of the particulars pertaining to um, pesticide credits, because I know uh, that is a topic of interest uh, to many. Everything you need uh, for your pesticide accreditation was captured at registration when you signed up for this session. So uh, when you put in your uh, contact information, you were asked to list the state that you wanted pesticide credits in. You were asked to list uh, your license number. And we use that information to create a roster uh, that is submitted to the uh, various state departments of agriculture. So everything is already accounted for. There is no action needed uh, on your end to receive your pesticide credits for participating in today's session live. There have been questions uh, over the course of 2022, uh, particularly with Tennessee pesticide credits. Uh, I know in my conversations with the Tennessee Department of Ag, uh, they are extremely short staffed at the moment. Uh, so there will be a lag time uh, with the credits for participating in one of our live sessions, hitting your online account. Uh, however, they have assured me that uh, those the participation in a live session will award you the credits that you are after. Uh, and we keep uh, backup rosters uh, on file here uh, as proof of your attendance. So uh, you should be 100% covered um, on that front. Uh, should also let you know, uh, today's session is being recorded. Uh, we post the archived video uh, and audio on the UT Turfgrass YouTube channel. Uh, and the archived audio uh, will go on to uh, our uh, Tennessee Turf Tuesdays uh, podcast feed on Apple Podcasts. Um, if you have any questions as we go through uh, today's session, uh, we encourage you to ask those questions through the Q&A box on the bottom of your screen. Uh, this is really helpful. It not only uh, allows us to track uh, the questions as they come in, uh, it keeps questions and answers threaded. We're going to do our best to try to uh, answer all your questions aloud, being that this is an audio format uh, by and large. So uh, we'll make every effort to do so. I think that uh, that covers all uh, all the business uh, of today's session. Uh, we've got our usual cast of characters here. Uh, my friend, Dr. Horvath, how are you today, Dr. Horvath? Doing good, Jim. My friend, Dr. Kylie Dixon, uh, sports turf uh, specialist here at the University of Tennessee. How are you, Kylie? Doing great. Thanks for being here. And then Tyler Carr, a uh, PhD student uh, who's helped us with many a Turf, Turf Tuesday session. How are you today, Tyler? Well, glad to be here, guys. And our uh, our guest of honor, Mr. Brian Ogle, CSFM from Neyland Stadium. Thanks for being with us, Brian. Thank you for having me. Appreciate you taking the time out of your day, you know, being weeks away from the start of football, the uh, give us a little update on everything Neyland. Um, before we get into the nuts and bolts, do you want to give the, the folks that are listening a little bit of a background on yourself and your unique connection to the operations over there? Uh, sure can. Um, my name is Brian Ogle. Um, I have been working at Neyland Stadium um, for going on 20 years now. Um, I started in 2003 as a uh, part-time student working on the weekends and um, during the summer. Um, that's because my, my father, my dad, worked here as a mechanic on the grounds crew for 41 years. Uh, so I've, I've been a little kid running around on this field uh, my entire life, um, and now I get the uh, opportunity to take care of it, you know, day-to-day -day operations on it. Um, I started, like I said, I started part-time in 2003, um, went to University of Tennessee, uh, got my 
undergrad in uh, 2010. Um, I came back and uh, got my master's degree in uh, 2020 um, in plant sciences and turf grass. Um, my master's project was uh, dealing with the, um, the application of paint on Neyland Stadium. Uh, that's my favorite thing to do uh, in this job is uh, apply the paint, get the checkerboards painted, the uh, power tee, and get it all nice and pretty ready for a game day. That's my favorite part. So I was lucky enough with uh, to work with um, you, Dr. Brosnan, and Dr. Horvath, and Dr. Schrocken on uh, obtaining my master's degree in 2020. Um, well, and you're, you're, uh, so good at, you're so good at painting, Brian, that uh, you've kind of become a little famous, right? Aren't you in a commercial? Uh, yeah, I've, I've been, they've had me on a commercial singing uh, Rocky Top, painting the end zones. I'm not much of a singer, but uh, I can paint, that's for sure. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about, um, you know, painting practices today and, and how it's changed over time as a, uh, you know, a, a result of the research that you did about how they were painting the field. And I know you've probably uncovered some things maybe underground with paint that are uh, pretty striking. Yeah, you're, you'll see a couple of pictures that are pretty uh, astonishing, I think. So, I mean, it hasn't been a typical summer at Neyland, right? No, it has not. Um, right after the last game on Vanderbilt, um, that Monday we came into work and there was a construction floor being placed on our field. It went across the north end zone and then uh, almost to the – uh, in between the numbers and the hash marks on the west sideline. Um, and that floor stayed down up until uh, two weeks ago. So it was down for eight months and we had cranes and concrete trucks and whatever else piece of equipment if it on the field for this past eight months. And this is like a, a seating expansion and, and a renovation, like a concourse type renovation by and large? Yeah, so the uh, the west sideline was the original portion of the stadium that was built. Um, I, I believe is in 1917 um, is when it was originally uh, got built, and the uh, the support structure underneath was uh, deteriorating, and so they had to go in there and completely remove that west sideline and build it back up. Wow. So, you know, you said this this started right after the Vanderbilt game. So no, no orange and white spring game. Did it affect like spring practice? Was that, I mean, uh, probably no yeah, they, practice in the stadium, no, right? We've, we've had no, no event since um, uh, November of last year. They've, there have been no scrimmages. They've, they've brought recruits down to show them the, the uh, construction and, you know, the stadium, but that's about it. We've had no one else here in the stadium. It's a little different because, you know, we hold the spring, the orange and white game, the spring game. Uh, they, you know, Coach Hypel brings the team down and scrimmages a couple times during the spring. And like I said, it's, it's been a weird, weird um, year for the field on Neyland because it's not being used. So what, you know, what happens now? I mean, we're August 2nd. When's, when's the first game? Early September, right? Uh, September the... First is the first game. Thursday so you're, night. you're four weeks, you're four weeks out. I mean, how do we go from construction site floor, you know, uh, fl flooring on the field for eight months to playing a national TV game here in a month? Uh, a lot of work, a lot of work went into it. I've got a couple of pictures. If you want me to go ahead and share those. Yeah, that'd be great. So, um, let's see Can you see that? Yes, sir. So as you can see, this floor right here was what was laid down on and it was basically a bunch of two by eight stacked on top of each other. Um, and you know, this right here, it, you're looking at the southwest corner of the end zone. That's the, you know, obviously the checkerboards there and that's our border and that's our hash marks. Um, that's what we found underneath and they pulled that floor up um, not last Wednesday, but the week before. So um, it was uh, 
pretty interesting to see that it looks like it we had just panned it in November um, hmm. for that. Um, that's another picture. This is the grass that was not covered, and then obviously all of this was covered. And this is right here is the new construction that's they they've got. Um, as you can see, the construction workers are still working on it. Um, here's a little aerial picture up above from the second uh, second row of the stadium. That's how much was covered. As you can see here, they they went all the way across the north end zone and then all the way down the west sideline. You know, we it was about forty feet of our field. You know, on the that they took that they had covered, um, we actually had to right here in the sand area right here, we had to tap into our main irrigation line and run a makeshift um, pipe with uh, sprinklers along that sideline to keep this side watered. Um, Cause this, this side right here on the west sideline or the east sideline, I'm sorry, um, we, that all stayed, uh, we all met, we, we, done our thing and manicured that all season long while construction was going on so um there's a little bit closer view of our irrigation system like i said we have little make we have cannons that were we had four cannons we set and we have mounts made um to irrigate that side because all our normal irrigation cannons were covered um Pretty, uh, we, it, it was, it wasn't as bad as we thought it was going to be when they pulled the floor up. We, we expected, you know, the floor to be sunken in and, you know, big ruts and everything down. It, the, 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 the sand was pretty smooth, uh, for the most part. Uh, the floor actually did its job. Um, it, all this was decaying though. It, when they pulled it up, it smelled like death. Um, <laughs> so, this was last, like I said, two Wednesdays ago. Um, so two wow. weeks from two weeks from tomorrow is what is what this picture was taken. Um, and since then, uh, did, they, did you did they have just drivable flooring down, or was there drivable flooring in plywood? What all was I said, did, they, did they have down? That floor, I've, I've never seen a floor like that. It was basically they, they called it a logging road um basically it was just a bunch of two like four stacks of two by eights like screwed together and big big sections it was it was it was thick it was probably you know 10 inches thick um but it was all wood and that was what was weird um i don't i don't it's know not if something I you would typically see for for um a concert like, like no, on a no, they, they have, we have a drivable plastic floor. Um, and they were afraid that with all the, the heavy equipment on it, that that floor wasn't the, the drivable floor wasn't going to hold up or, you know, it was going to sink in this floor. We were, we were impressed. We were skeptical, uh, when they first put it down that, like I said, you can barely see it there, how thick it is. And there's a, you know, excavator with a grapple on it, picking it up and, um, we were impressed by how well that floor did and held up to that um, that amount of weight and traffic on on the grass. Um, so that was this is what it looked like, you know, two Wednesdays ago, and then last week um, we had Carolina Green come in, and they stripped all of the uh, the what was left of the sod, let me put it that way. Um, <laughs> uh, they started on Tuesday, last Tuesday, and they went three inches down with their uh, combinator, which is like a, uh, you know, a big rotiller with a conveyor belt on it. Um, and they stripped three inches um, away and hauled it off. And um, that's what we were left with underneath. Uh, a lot of, uh, the root zone was still intact. Um, they actually, it was, it was quite funny to us because there was some areas, you know, I, you can barely see it right, right there. We're in, in the cracks 
where that floor was, the Bermuda grass was actually coming up through the floor. Um, so, and with a week of it breathing, it, it was starting to turn green again. It was, it was wild. It was, it was crazy to see that Bermuda grass bounce back after being covered by a construction floor for eight months and starting to green back up within a week. Um, obviously we didn't have the time to, uh, to grow that back in, but it would have been interesting to see how long it would have took to actually green back up and covered. Um, but I, this is Carolina greens guys. Um, they, uh, like I said, they took three inches down and this well, it's is, funny, uh, it's funny, Brian, the weed scientist in me just hears that and thinks, you know, people wonder why we try to selectively remove Bermuda grass from other turf. And it's really, really hard. It, I mean, it, put it, it, put it under under a floor for eight months and it's still alive. I mean, if anything just speaks to the power of what, what's there, it's that. Exactly. It's that stuff will take over the world if you let it. Um, so they went through there and um, combinated it out, saw it cut the edges. And then this is uh, Darren Sebo, our director um, with a Unirake um, circling and uh, just trying to knock down the edges uh, from that combinator that they used, um, that Unirake, uh, we just got that, and it's it's a pretty pretty neat machine there that we have a, a tool that we are starting to use now. Uh, so this was this was there, Wednesday of last week is what this picture was taken. Sorry, because there's grade, Brian. Right for those that might be listening that aren't familiar, I mean the from the center of the field to the sideline, there's a grade that you need to keep in place for for water movement. Correct? Yeah, it's almost. I think it's at um, one and a half percent. So from the 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 center of the field, like the in the middle of the field to this sidewalk here, it's it's almost. Um, you know, it's almost. It's about you know, almost a foot difference. You know, if you drew wow. a straight, straight line from here and then to where this was, this is probably, it's probably over a little bit of a foot, probably it's, it may, it may be, you know, closer to 16 inches, um, 16 or 17 inches from the, from the middle of that field over to the sidewalk. That's how much that um, is sloped. And we were originally worried that, you know, this, this area was going to be, you know, demo, you know, just rutted up and, you know, tore all the pieces. And uh, we originally were going to, you know, take all this out and have to, uh, you know, till it up and regrade it. But it was so good underneath the floor um, that we just we stripped it three inches all the way across, and we got to keep our grade and didn't have to worry about uh, regrading it at all. So. We were thankful for that. It actually saved us a lot of time. So this is sod going back down. This would have been last Thursday. Um, this is a picture of the west sideline here. Um, this grass came from Carolina Green. Um, it's latitude 36. Um, and this is this right here is the section that we've been taking care of. And this is the new the new side we were pretty impressed with the the quality of the grass and the uh the color match it's a little off but it's it's not as bad as we thought it was going to be um so this well, was last thursday and, and as a sideline i mean a lot of that you know during the game is going to be covered with with temporary uh temporary flooring right that the team uses for staging yeah we have uh our sideline tarps that you know will cover you know the team area and then you know we have a dance team that cheerleaders that kind of do their thing right here and we have a tarp that lays down for that so that this sideline um you won't see it during the game because of those uh tarps you know from about you know this workman over is will be on the playing surface um it's um you know, like I said, it, it was in between the, the numbers and the outside hash marks is how far it went over. And then this is a picture this morning. Um, this is a couple of days. Like, they got done laying Friday night, and today is, you know, Tuesday morning. So, you know, 
couple of days of the sod, you know, going through its shock cycle and uh, we've mowed it. This is, we, we actually vertical mowed this this morning um, because we've, what we do when we get new sod um, is we like to roll, roll it with a uh, asphalt roller and get everything as smooth as possible, get these seams as smooth and level as possible. And then we'll aerate it to, you know, let it breathe um, and go back through and roll it again, aerate it again, probably. And then we'll, then we'll mow it. Um, we obviously don't want to scalp it. Um, there's a couple areas you can see here that actually did get scalped from the mowing. Um, we're not too concerned about that. Um, it'll, it'll bounce back. Um, but um, we're happy with uh, how it came out. Uh, like I said, they got done uh, Friday night. I was here Friday night till about 10 p.m. So I worked about uh, worked about 70 hours last week um, altogether because um, we also we had, we were sodding Neyland and getting it ready, and um, we also had our spring football started yesterday. So we were also bouncing back and forth from Neyland to our three practice fields. Um, so it, we, our crew put in some hours last week. So Brian, hey, Brian. Did, did Chad, did he, uh, did he, was he managing this the same way you were as far as fertility goes, or did you kind of let him do his thing and then you bring it in, you're going to get it into your fertility regimen or how are you going about the fertility on that? Uh, once it gets on in our hands, we, we start our fertility uh, program on it. We've already sprayed it. Um, we sprayed it um, Sunday, um, and like I said, once Chad's, um, you know, more concerned about, you know, growth and, you know, pushing the sod to get it to grow um, so he can sell it, we're not in that um, realm of fertility program. We are, you know, minimal at least. We, we put maybe about a pound a month on it of, of in. So we're really light on our fertility. Um, but um, like I said, we, once it's laid and they leave, it's, it's ours. We take care and we do exactly what we would do to this area that we would do to this, so. Okay, so there's no difference in the grow in period when you're trying to get it kind of acclimated. You just kind of give it that same thing so that it gets into your normal routine of what it would do as far as fertility. You apply whatever you're going to apply. You do the so it's most consistent surface as you go across that. Yeah, that's 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 how we kind of look at it. We know that you know this one has been probably loaded up a little bit more in. So and it's you know it's in a shock, um, you know of getting cut and getting transferred and rolled and you know all that um but we we feel like you know once you it's ours that you know we're just going to manage it all the same um and just let it you know equal out so how long is the current field the part that wasn't renovated how long has that been in like for a comparison for so from, time without having to resod i think right yeah it's the last time this field got resodded was in 2017. So it, this grass right here has been down for five years. Uh, and that's and what is the variety? Okay, because it's the it's same variety you brought in to match. Yeah, it's it's latitude 36 is what is what we have on Neyland and our practice fields. Okay. And the, the five years is a big deal, right, Brian? I mean, I know that in my time at Tennessee, that hasn't always been the case, that a field would stay in place for that long. And I have to imagine that that leads to a stronger product that's that's a little bit more resilient and durable, right? Yeah. yeah um, we went through a couple of uh, coaches that didn't like how it looked during the spring transition of, you know, spraying the ryegrass out. Uh, they wanted it green all the time. So we had a couple coaches that actually made us resod this um, this stadium every year. It's not what we wanted, of course, but it's, you know, they're the ones that make the decisions. So um, we, we resodded from, you know, about seven years from 2010 through 2017 when 
when Pruitt got here, he he let us do our thing and, you know, went through a spring transition. And, you know, Hopple has been uh, great for us. Uh, he, uh, he lets us do our uh, thing and get through all that. So um, the coach uh, has a little bit of say in what we do. And like I said, we, we're kind of handcuffed sometimes by what the coach wants. wants so... Uh, but this this part right here has been down since 2017, and it's it's got roots. We we pulled a uh, a soil sample or a, a profile out, and it's it, their roots, you know, about 10 inches deep. So we're so, we're really happy with this. So going forward, Brian, is there a more construction plan for next year? They're going to be on the field, or are they kind of done with like being on the field and putting stuff on there? Um. We've been told a couple different things. Um, at some point, this south end zone uh, will get redone. We don't know if it's going to be, you know, next year or the next or, you know, whenever. Um, but we feel like it will be coming um, at some point. Um, whenever they do decide to do that south end zone, we are actually going to take the crown out of this field and install um, a sub air system and, you know, get this down to a half percent um, and redo all the drainage and stuff. Because this, this field was built in 1994 and all the drainage system has been in there since 1994. Um, it's, it's nothing has really changed underneath, um, you know, substrate uh, as far as that. So, we want to uh, get the get the crown out because you know most modern fields now with the way the drainage is, um, you know you can get by with a half percent and it you know drains just fine. So in your time there, Brian, have you ever had it to where like there's been a big rain event and you've ever had rain sitting on like water sitting on the surface? Is it always drained fast enough that it really wouldn't impact the game? Um, well, uh, I think it was 2017, I believe, or 16. I can't, I think it's 2016. We played LSU here, um, and we had a monsoon. Um, that was the most water I've ever seen come down during a game. And, you know, that water stood on it for a couple minutes and it soaked right through. Um, the, I, we think the drainage is still fine. Um, there's no problems draining. It's just, you know, it's just time for an update. It's, you know, in two years, it'll be 30 years old. And that's a lot to ask for a, for a athletic field of this caliber, you know? Yeah. So since, since you switched to latitude, have you noticed a difference? Cause it was 419 before that, correct? And then you switched to latitude. Have you seen improvements with latitude that you like that you weren't, maybe didn't see with 419? Yeah, we really like the latitude. Um, you know, in this climate zone, you know, um, I think it's the best variety that we've seen. Uh, we've, you know, there's other varieties out there. Um, you know, the North Bridge, that's the home and stuff. We've, we've, we've looked at those. Um, we actually tried this latitude on the practice field for a year and saw how it done before we made a switch um, from the 419. The 419 was, you know, it, it, it did well, um, but, you know, there's always, you know, something newer and, better out there and we really really like this latitude um it's more shade tolerant um because you get longer you winter like here, as far as green into the, in the fall like you notice that like color retention to be better with that versus 419 with the latitude i think so yeah it like i said it's more cold tolerant shade tolerant so you know going into those late november games you know we, we've still got green bermuda grass um you know it's it hasn't fully went into dormancy like uh yeah like you know maybe 419 would um and it, i don't know if you can these three shadows right here um are part of the, the new uh, oh yeah. that, that are on the stadium <laughs> so this is something we're going to have to deal with here is you know this was this that, that was taken this morning at about eight o'clock so we're, we'll have you three do the other side, do you get shade the up from the other ones now too? Yeah. Like on the off, yeah. both, both VLS, so whichever side of the scoreboard you're on? Yeah, this will be this will be the morning shade, and then in the afternoon they'll be over here because the sun will be, you know, on from this angle that I'm looking at now. 
So, so the, the, the grass you have on here is pretty resilient because isn't this the one that was Garth Brooks concert was on the one in the middle, like the to the that wasn't renovated. This had the Garth Brooks concert on it didn't have to be renovated was able to pop back and was a really good grass as far as the events you've had on there. Yeah, I, I said that's yeah that that was a, that was the biggest test for the latitude that um, that really really sold me on this grass was you know we had a November concert for Garth Brooks in two thousand um, I think it was nineteen it was right before COVID um, you know they laid a floor down for a week on it in between the the home games and you know we had a Garth Brooks concert and then we took the floor up and. It was playable. Uh, you know, we were we were planning on resodding the end too. Um, just you know, having it ready and to go, and we felt like you know it might do some damage. And um, to its credit, this grass has been phenomenal for us. Um, do you we, feel like uh, it's a denser grass than four nineteen? Like as far as like when you get it kind of down and tight, because it, it seems to be very tight when they're playing on it, and you get a good cleat in, cleat out type of situation when they're running on it. Yeah, for our for our mowing height, you know, we mow um, our for for game days. We it's at three quarters of an inch. Um, it's a lot denser. The the leaf blades are finer, so there's way more leaf blades per you know whatever you know square foot um, on this grass um, than the four nineteen. Um, it's it's dense. It's thick, and you know, uh, after a game you know 60 minutes of guys running up and down playing football you know we mow it and blow blow it off and you know we're not having to patch really any big divots at all it's it's or cleat marks or anything it's 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 dense and it's it's tough uh, i'll just interject real quick uh brian you know we, we did a project in in my group this summer and you granted it was golf focused looking at at dividing um and and latitude was by far and away the winner in terms of divot recovery rate um i i was shocked how much faster uh the divot recovery was relative to um to 419 and it probably shouldn't have been right i mean i think one of the things yeah. that 419 was like the standard bear Bermuda grass for so long that it's kind of we've gotten to a place where we kind of assume things are going to respond just like 419. But I know we've seen some unique differences in the new Bermuda grasses, be it Latitude, Tahoma, or Northbridge, um, with how they respond to different herbicide applications. And now this little project we're doing with dividing, I'm sure, Kylie, I mean, in the type of testing that you and Dr. Sarah can do you've probably seen some differences between them also, right? Yeah, that's one of the the beauty of these, some of these new varieties is that we finally found something for years. It was the, could we get something comparable to Tifway? And now we're getting traffic tolerance, traction levels that are better than Tifway, or if not just as good. And some of these improvements that Brian was mentioning as far as the cold tolerance that we're getting into later into the year or spring getting up a lot faster. So it's been a really neat just to kind of see this evolution of, new Bermuda grasses in the past 10 years or so that's really just kind of been great for the sports turf market particularly but I think it's helped golf and like all areas of turf grass as far as that would go um, with that but it's it's been a very interesting just to see and it's great to see like that a Garth Brooks concert and then you were able to play after that and just the, uh, what you guys have been able to pull through Brian has been amazing with that there's some questions Brian um, in the chat that I was going to just go ahead and ask you to uh, try to make sure we got these one of them says, do you have latitude on your native soil fields? Because I thought you just redid soccer too, right? Isn't that happening? Uh, we are in the process of redoing soccer. Uh, sod is going to be going down, I think, uh, starting on Sunday. Um, they they flattened it to a half percent because um, the crown was basically, you know, close to what Neyland was. It, it was built around the same time the, the game soccer field was. Uh, we're actually going with Tahoma. On, on that field, um, just, uh, you know, we've, we've heard a lot of um, good things about Tahoma and, you know, we want to see what, you know, it'll do for soccer, um, cause, you know, cleat wise and running around. I know the, you know, the player, you know, 130 pound girl is a little bit different than a 300 pound lineman, but um, we're, we're interested to see how, how the Tahoma holds up. So are the football practice fields, are they, 
their latitude though? Yes. Yeah. Like I said, we, we actually started, you know, we, everything was 419. Um, and I think it was 2015, I think 16 of, sorry, the years run together. Um, I think we, we, we were 419 across the board. Um, and we tried one of our practice fields in latitude and I think 2016 and went through a, you know, a full season on it and really liked it, you know, uh, held up well, you know, everything that we like to see. And then we made the transit in you know, the last year that we sodded, um, Neyland, you know, we went to latitude and it's like, it's latitude. It's been in Neyland, like I said, and then we, we, we actually redid our practice fields and increased them because we had just one and a half. And now we have, uh, we had three and now we're back down to two and a half. Um, <laughs> so with construction on the practice field, it's, we're they're always doing something, construction, building something over around here. But um, what are the sub base um, of the practice fields just for the people that aren't familiar with them? So there are our new ones are all sand based. We have one the the half field now, it was a full field. It was a um, a sandy loam mix. Um and it it that field is a tank. It it um it's the one that gets used the least is which is the uh the what we scratch our heads about um because it the grass is just so well rooted in that um that sandy mix um but the new ones are all sand based it's um 10 inches of sand uh four inches of gravel and then our drainage underneath that on the practice field so when you bring in sod brian like what you have in the photo here for the kneeling renovation is that sod that's grown on plastic to have that sand base root zone that matches what's in in Neyland Stadium yes Chad this is all uh Chad Price of Carolina Green he, he grows all this on plastic it's like I said it's three inches thick um we use this very similar sand um that he top dresses with what we use um and this grass is actually I think it's either two or three years old itself um, so he planted this grass from Spriggs um, either two or three years ago when it's been on his farm. He's been maintaining it for two or three years, waiting for, you know, this. Because we knew we were going to do this. He just didn't know when. Because um, we were supposed to originally done this project uh, in 2020. Um, so Chad planted this, this field for us then. And obviously COVID hit and, you know, everything got put on hold um until now so this this is two-year-old sod right here okay hey brian in in regards to that line is did did chad come in with the 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 uh whatever it's called the the top maker or the the uh combinator or whatever and take out that area of kind of more rank growth along the edge that you had yeah. in the other pictures so that yeah. you kind of went more into the field for the sod than where the original line was right yeah mm -hmm. yeah um so you can see where this um little water cam was that's yeah. the line that we cut so basically gotcha. if you draw a straight line going to here um that you know, it's probably close to the bottom of the numbers. You know, it, the, the original floor was in between them. You know, we, we went, I, I would say, probably three or four foot over towards the like middle. Another of the whole field. sod width. Yeah. Just to, just to get rid of this. Because, like I said, this where this pipe was laying for eight months, it was, you know, uh, watered out really good and not level. And, you know, this, this grass was just full of rocks and you know bolts and stuff from the construction area so we just decided to just to get a fresh clean line all the way down right Brian, we have a question on here in the q a this is related back to um after the grass has been installed you talked about um that they put a lot of nitrogen down at the at the sod farm 
And Preston asks, why do you guys go so light on fertilizer? And asks if it, if it just doesn't need it. Um, we like to control it. Um, we like to, our theory behind that is make the roots search for nutrients. Um, so if we're not giving a lot of nitrogen or fertilizer up on top, it's, it's having to search for it. So in our, our fertilization program theory behind that is, you know, go as light as possible, make the roots grow down deeper, uh, make the grass stronger. And then, you know, if, if we feel like it's, it's getting too lean or, you know, not growing enough, we're not cutting an, enough off of it, then, then we can add to it to, to, you know, give it a little boost or whatever. Basically we're, we spoon feed until we need it and then we can apply more. And and I, there's and a I, lot of, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, I just, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I was going to say, I think one of the things that, that with particularly nitrogen fertilization that people forget about, and I know uh, Dr. Horvath's been working on this a little bit in, in the golf space too, is that the organic matter that's in the soil has nitrogen in it, right? That is mm -hmm. going to be broken down microbially, particularly in warmer temperatures. Um and I think often we get into this place with turf grass where we think about like, well, the only inputs are the ones that run through the spreader or the sprayer, um, but we're going to get organic nitrogen released from organic matter as microbes break that down. And I'm sure, Brian, you, you, you see that with the Bermuda grass that comes in as sod, particularly one that's been pushed with nitrogen to get mature enough that it, to the point where it can be lifted and harvested. Yeah. Yeah, like I said, you know, his whole deal is, you know, production. He wants it to grow as fast as it can so he can cut, you know, cut it and move it and sell it. You know, I, we, we're not like that. We, we want the field to, to play the best, um, to look the best. And, you know, that's just what we found is, you know, low nitrogen level uh, fertilization program has, has done wonders for that. So going back to your paint photo really quickly um, from the sideline when the flooring, the flooring originally came up as somebody who did a master's degree in painting, does that surprise you that the paint lasted that long and, and ghosted the way that it did for eight months? It really did. Um, you know, basically, it, you know, that's, we put those down in November and it looks like we just painted them yesterday, you know, um, my whole master's project was figuring out, you know, what, you know, pressures and nozzles, um, using the gun and, you know, applying the paint, you know, did the, lo the least amount of damage to the grass. Um, so when they, when we, they took the floor up, we were very surprised that um, the, the, the amount of paint that we use was still visible um, because, uh, you know, a lot of other schools, they, they paint their logos and, you know, lines and stuff, you know, twice and sometimes even three times, three, three different app, you know, they'll paint the same thing three times. Um, and we paint all of our stuff once, um, and get a good application down. Um, and it's, very interesting to see that this grass that that paint stayed around um underneath that floor for eight months um, so and, and to get by with one painting i mean is that a situation where you're changing the the you know amount of water to paint the ratio of of, of water to paint when you spray to make it maybe thicker or can you elaborate a little bit more about what you've done to, to get to a place of only having to paint one time so um, we bought our paint it's in a concentrated form and we mix it, you know, it comes in five gallon buckets and we mix, you know, all of our, uh, stuff one to one ratio, one bucket of water to, you know, one bucket of paint. So five gallons of paint to five gallons of water. Um, and that's what we, what's what we use, um, for basically everything that's on the field, um, you know, logos, lines, you know, numbers, all of that. Um, but my master study was actually on, you know, using different pressures and nozzle sizes 
to um, minimize the amount of paint being applied to the grass because we're having to paint this grass, you know, weeks, every week. Um, so there's, you know, there's, I guess, eight home games this year. Um, so we're having to paint this, this end zone eight different times. Um, and some of them are, you know, back to back to back. You know, we have three, three home games in a row um, sometimes. So, you know, by the third week, you know, we're, we're not, we're, we're painting what, what you see here. The grass hasn't been able to grow through it. So what we, what my master study was on was how do we minimize that, the damage of the amount of paint applied. Um, we've actually found that you can get by with less paint, paint, I'm sorry, paint, um, applied to this grass com compared to somebody that's sprayed double the amount or triple the amount and the brightness level of that paint is only one to two percent difference so with the naked eye um i don't feel like you can see one percent difference in brightness for this white square here or the orange or you know what have you but um in the amount of paint applied to it, it's almost almost triple. Um, so we've lowered our pressures on our paint gun and uh, gone with smaller nozzle tips um, than some other people use and actually um, found that actually less is more when we apply the paint, so. It's a pretty significant cost savings too, isn't it, Brian? Yes, it's over the years that you know we've calculated you know this paint isn't cheap but you know us dropping the pressure and the the nozzle size down we've actually saved over a hundred thousand dollars in paint over you know over the course of about five years actually more we've been doing it since you know 2016 now so you know six years so we're probably up in the hundred twenty thousand dollar range of what we've saved for our budget to even, you know go towards equipment now. it's more relevant now because i've talked to some people paint is going up in, in price too that's true yeah that's, that's all of, that's all 2016 numbers is what i'm mm -hmm. going off of so are you having trouble of, getting paint this year brian like have you had any no. problem with that or would they get on supplies uh, no um actually all the paint you know they called us you know we got our paint from world class um they called us you know in the spring and said hey how much are you going to need you know how much do you think you'll use and you know based off what we've done in the past we had a pretty good ideal and they've they've come through for us we call them and say hey we need a pile of white delivered to us and they, it's here the next day so we haven't had any problems at all um with them as far as that kind of supply stuff and Brian, for those who might be unfamiliar that are listening, typical games on you know, game days on Saturday, walk us through the process of painting the field. When does that start? How long does it take just for, for somebody who might be completely unfamiliar? Um, so it's a three day process. Um, we actually start on Wednesday morning. Um, we do our lines. Um, we sled our lines. Um, Wednesday morning, and then we'll do uh, the border um, on Wednesday afternoon. Uh, Thursday, we'll come in and we'll lay in all of our hash marks, you know, numbers, you know, um, lay out the T, lay out the SEC logo, start on our white checkerboards. Uh, we do on Thursday, it's, it's all white. Um, everything is white. So, um, and then Friday, um, we go in with our orange, do the orange end zones, you know, fill in the T, fill in the SEC logos. And then, you know, we have some press lines and stuff that we do in orange too. So uh, we stretch it out um, for a three-day process. Um, if, of course, if it's a rain, uh, you know, it rains, you know, Wednesday or Thursday or whatever, we can, we can adjust, you know, it, you know, if it's, 100% chance of rain on Friday, we'll paint everything Wednesday and Thursday. That's why we we like to stretch it out just so we have time and we're not rushed um, because 
obviously we want the product to look good and be good, you know. So that's our kind of the the bare bones of our paint process. We have, um, let's see, we have five full-time guys that help um, here full-time. And then we rely on turf grass students from, you know, you guys from Horvath and uh, Bras and Dr. Sorokin's students. We hire at least probably about 10 uh, of those turf grass students to help us. And uh, every one of them loves, loves helping me able to paint on game day or for, for a game day, let me say. So are you needing students for this fall, Brian, still? We can always use help, Callie. <laughs> That's always good. Um, so what about the, the where you're painting, where the paint goes on the grass? Do you ever notice any negative effects where you have paint? Does it seem to like shade out some of where it's getting the sunlight so those plants can do the photosynthesis? Or do you notice much of a difference where you paint versus where you don't paint? It's just green area of grass. Um, before? Um, you know, when we were applying a lot of paint um, and, you know, using, you know, before we changed our technique of painting, you could definitely tell um, that it was, you know, hurting the grass. It was, you know, wasn't coming back. It, it was, you know, it was just covered in paint. Um, since, since we've changed our painting technique, um, this end zone will actually be faded out. I mean, it won't be, you know, it'll, it'll still be visible, but um, there'll be a lot of green in it by the next week. Um, so um, we found that, you know, from, from where it's not been painted to a painted, we try to keep that as similar as possible. Obviously, this is getting a coat of paint, you know, eight times a year compared to this is getting nothing. So obviously, you know, this is going to be better grass, but it's, it's not much of a difference in between them. Brian, I'll, I'll say like, just as an outside observer, the thing that I've noticed the most since you did your masters is how much healthier that end zone is compared to what it was prior to you uh, kind of figuring those things out and figuring out what levers you could pull to keep the, you know, because at the end of the day, the product and what it looks like is what's important, right? Yeah. And if you mm -hmm. had to go in and sod out the turf to repaint it, you know, to keep the product what it's supposed to look like, that's one thing. But with what you found with your masters, I mean, not only being able to save the money, save the paint, but, you know, improve the, the ability of that turf to stay, you know, at least alive and relatively reasonably growing well. That's the, the thing that I've noticed the biggest difference in the times I've come down on the field with you is seeing just how much healthier that turf is, especially under like the orange paint, which seemed to be a lot worse to the turf than the white paint even, right? Yeah. Um, you know, when you walk across our end zone, you're actually still walking on grass. There's a lot of right. guys out there that, you know, they apply so much paint that you're walking, you're, you're hearing a crunch when you walk across it. That's how much paint they're applying. Um, yeah, for sure. It's our style and way that we've, we've done. It's, it's definitely helped us at, for overall health of the grass, for sure. So, so we're Brian, getting got a question. Oh, go ahead, Kyle. Some, somebody wanted to know if they can come help out if they're not a UT student, could they come volunteer? <laughs> uh we get that asked a lot um we you know we have a certain amount of you know crew that you know we can't have 30 people you know come every day uh we'll be tripping over ourselves so we have a you know certain amount we usually have about 10 to 12 and uh you know obviously with our full-time guys and then the students you know the, the crews filled up so unfortunately not well, and I'm sure you got to put your time in for a while before you can put your hands on a painter. Yeah, for sure. That's, you know, I, we, we love to, you know, teach these students, um, you know, our, the ways that, that we manicure the grass and everything. And then, you know, game day um, painting and then, you know, being on the field for during the game is kind of a, a treat for them, a, a reward for, you know, all their hard work that they've helped us with because, 
there's a lot of times that, you know, we couldn't do it without their help, you know. And I, I know they don't realize that sometimes, but we really do appreciate the, all the help that we get from the turf grass students for sure. Well, and I know they're appreciative of the opportunity. I mean, it's super cool and, and gives them a real world experience of manicuring a field at the highest level. And it's been a really good, uh, really good partnership, I think, for everybody involved. You know, yeah. as we as we get towards the the end of our hour here, Brian, and again, I know we're super appreciative of you taking the time to visit with us and the folks listening um, are super appreciative as well to get a sneak peek um, at what's going on before the season starts. What's the timeline on the project finishing uh, in terms of them being done with the construction end of it prior to the first game? Um, I wish I knew, Doc. Um, they'll probably be out there Friday before the game, or when we play on Thursday, so they'll probably be out there Wednesday night doing something before the game. Um, like I said, the 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 main structure is done. Um, I'm sure there's stuff that they're Wait, I know for I know for a fact that they were waiting on a lot of supply chain issues. Um, they were they were doing a lot of uh, ordering, and it, hey, it's six month lead time. It's twelve week lead time. What you know, what whatever part or piece they need. Just talking to those construction guys, they they were waiting on a lot of stuff to get here. So I would say probably you know. They'll be working on it during the season, probably still installing, you know, whatever um, they need to get done. But as far as the field wise, the field the field will, will be ready for sure. That's that's yeah, undoubtedly that'll be uh, that'll be for sure. Well, I only have one more question for you. I mean, you've you've been through kind of a firing squad of questions here today, and I appreciate you uh, taking all of them. My last question for you is: Do field managers get NIL deals, and what do they look like? I sure wish they did. Um, I don't know if I could use my singing voice or not to get an NIL deal, but uh, I'd sure like to try. Got to think there's a royalty there somewhere, right? Uh, you would think. Well, in all seriousness, though, Brian, thank, thanks again for, for your time. And I think we'll we'll wrap it here as we approach kind of the end of our hour. Um and we'll be back uh, next month in September for the September edition of Turf Tuesdays and uh, talk about early order programs, which may be something for those of you uh, listening. You might not be familiar with early order programs, often abbreviated EOPs. They're a, a big part of um, the turf grass industry and particularly how products get moved to operations. Uh, so we're going to have two guests join us to talk about that. So until next time, we'll uh, we'll see you then. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon.